OK, you ready to go here, Nick? All right. Uh, hello, JudyCon. <laughs> I'm Hinek, and I have exactly one minute to change your life, which I will do. I want you to imagine a better world. A world where we get the very best future from Golang in Python. A world where you can fully focus on the meaning of your code, because you don't have to spend time on caring about the look of your code. A world where you don't have to argue with anyone about the style of your code, because it's formatted by an apathetic robot. And now that all those thoughts and imagination made you all happy and fuzzy in your tummies, I'm here to tell you this is reality. This is real life. Thanks to my friend Lukas. <laughs> <laughs> Getting this symbol on a slide in Keynote was more work than the other slides together. Anyway, he gave us black, the uncompromising code formatter. And it has really only one option, which is setting the maximum line length, which you, by the way, should send, uh, set to 79. Otherwise, I don't like you. And uh, everything else, you see it control over. At first, you will have objection with some of the choices. So did I. But you need to hang on. You need to embrace it. And you will get used to it. And then you just write your code. However it pops into your head, you just hit your keyboard, and it's there. And then you just run black over it, and it's done. So the menial work is done by the software. And then you realize how much more productive you are, how much energy you are, uh, you are freeing from your mind from doing menial things. And many of us found this experience life-changing. And I'm not even joking. So to get most of it, uh, you need to do what I like to call the holy trinity of I don't give an F, which is black will format your code, iSort will ddub and sort your imports, and pre-commit will make sure that both are run before each commit. So you don't even have to remember to run them, imagine. So free your mind, join the revolution. Many high profile projects have already switched. This is the future. Thank you. Thank you, Inet. Big round of applause. Hello. Take it away. Uh, my name is Davi, here's Poe. Uh, we're talking about Plone. Poe is go giving a uh, quick introduction about Plone, and then uh, I'll continue talking about React. And this is the next. How do you get the next? Um, ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Plone has been around for a very long time, as most of you know. Um, I could do a four Yorkshire man uh, talk saying, like, um, we were so old that we, uh, whoops, we had to invent daytime because Python didn't have a daytime. Um, but we're still around, and it's still being used by people who give a lot about their content. And we're playing the dongle game here. Um, it's doing something. dum de dum de dum Well, yeah. May, uh, <laughs> the problem is I don't see anything here as well. Um, but yeah, as... Um, as a very old system, um, you have to come with the times. Um, to be fairly honest, we were never really good at front end anyway. Uh, and nowadays, there are much better systems to do that. So um, we have now a complete API, a REST API, a fully RESTful API, um, that will expose all the power of Plone, including workflows, including collections, uh, including things like breadcrumbs, and if you do serious amounts of content, you have no idea how difficult breadcrumbs and navigation can get. It sounds trivial, but it's not. It's all exposed for, via, uh, via REST API, and that means we can now have all kinds of fun new front ends on it. And we have a um, demonstration, but the technical... Let's see... Thank you, it's the cable. The cable is... Yeah. Excuse me. Oh, this is reminding me of old Europythons. <laughs> <laughs> Every other laptop wouldn't work at all. And each one that you came up with, yeah, yeah, you had to yeah. find the right Ooh. connector. These days, well... It's very shaky. Then for a while, everything was HDMI. And now we have a combination of USB-C, HDMI, <laughs> older laptops. Dodgy cables. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, go. So. I think we can go for the demo. Oh. <laughs> it's it's trying. It's trying. No. <laughs> So 
So, yeah, the castle. People have been living on top of the castle for 2,700 years. <laughs> Sorry. Top of the rock, yes. rather. Oh, we have to hold um, it like this. Yes. Yeah, leave it like this. Okay. This is very yes. difficult. Okay, play the video. Okay, so okay, uh, let's play the video and watch. This is a React front-end for Plone. We are having this uh, tiles uh, implementation. Uh, you can to, to paginate your, or to create your page, to make layout in your page, uh, drag and drop. Uh, it's all uh, React components. Uh, we use semantic UI to, to uh, compose uh, and customize uh, uh, the pages later. Uh, you can, we currently have a tile for images, one tile for videos. This is very recent work. This is, has been done the last step at Barcelona uh, last week. Uh, you can download this uh, in github.com slash plone slash plone react and test yourselves. You basically run the backend as plone and also yarn dev to run uh, the, the front end client. Uh, there it is, this, that's the demo. Ah, I'll publish and just to show how it looks in the anonymous window. So it's very quick for content editors. And behind this, we have all the plone machinery, the workflow, very granular, very powerful. So it's not just uh, like a visual toy. Uh, I think we have more slides here. Uh, yeah, the extensibility story. Uh, it's, so as I said, uh, it's uh, semantic UI. Uh, less variables and overrides are available. There are body classes to customize the custom views, which are components. You, uh, you use composability to, to inherit like an album view, which is based by its uh, turn inherits from cards, from uh, components from semantic UI. And as related side projects, uh, there is a starter kit uh, based on uh, Cre uh, create React app, which is a command line to uh, initialize the boilerplate for your project. Uh, so you don't have to work, uh, fork Plone React. And also there is Plone Gatsby, another GSOC project, a Google Summer of Code project, uh, that to create uh, static sites, uh, HTML, you can publish on GitHub pages. So that's it. If you're interested, please. These are the guys doing the work. Uh, some of, I was here in Bonn. Uh, to one of the sprints. And if you want to get in touch, please follow me on Twitter at davilima6, Gmail, or LinkedIn. Thank you. A big round of applause. So yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Mariana. I'm a scientific engineer at Omnius, and I'm working on natural language processing and yeah, for NLP, as a first step, you usually need uh, word vectors. And today, I want to show you a library which gives you some more robust version of word vectors. So um, the library is called FastText. And one of the key questions of word vectors is always how to handle out of vocabulary words, so words you haven't seen during training. And FastText's answer to that is to use uh, subword information, so basically look at um, substrings uh, during the training. And I just want to show you uh, a quick demo to um, yeah, show the effect. So we got some uh, random <laughs> data set here, which is basically the description uh, of all the EuroPython talks. We are going to use that. And um, yeah, we're going to quickly train uh, word embedding model with fast text, which looks like this. Yeah, we're done already. It's super fast. And on the other hand, we're going to train a model that does not use subword information. Okay, so what we can do now is have a look at how um, the nearest neighbors of certain words uh, look in the embedding space. So we might try something like Python and get um, the closest, yeah, the nearest neighbors in the, in the embedding space. This is the model with um, subword information, so you can see um, the nearest neighbors also have pretty, the same, pretty much the same meaning. 
Um, if we try the same without the subword information, you will see that the nearest neighbors are somewhat random for such a small data set. Um, and the good thing is that we might also try out um, some typos and see that the, word, uh, the nearest neighbor still makes sense. While, yeah, on the other hand, this doesn't really work. Okay, so, whoops. Yeah, back to that. Um, it's nice to use fast text uh, when you have small data sets like description of the EuroPython talks because you will probably not have the words in all of their forms in your data set. And you can um, um, still get good work, uh, word vectors, although you have spelling mistakes. Um, for us at Omnius, uh, fast text is very useful because we're mostly working on text that we get from optical character recognition, and that's always prone to errors. Um, yeah, so the library itself is uh, at its core not written in Python, but there's a Python wrapper, and um, you can train and, and use models in Python, and we're, for example, using that in TensorFlow models. Um, yeah, so if you're working on something similar, I would recommend you to check this repository out, and I would be happy if you talk to me either now or later back in Berlin. Thanks. Thank you, Mariana. Hello, okay, everyone. Take it away. This is my first talk at EuroPython, and also first time wearing a kilt. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> um, um, I work at Yandex Moscow. Uh, you, uh, for those who know, doesn't know, um, it's a big Russian company uh, who provides such services as um, internet search, taxi aggregation, uh, and many, many others. But I would like to talk about my hobby, and uh, I like to teach uh, computer sciences, and uh, in particular Python, and uh, I enjoy it very much. And um, last year, I took some time to provide uh, courses for some groups of, you know, uh, major professionals uh, who wanted to learn some Python, and. Um, it was very fine, very nice, because uh, Python, it's a language that sells itself, you know. Uh, and, uh, but, of course, there were some topics that were kind of hard, hard to explain. So I uh, uh, employed some, maybe, tricks I want to share about one of them. Uh, it's about async. So we started with most simple example uh, in modern style, in modern syntax with async and uh, await keywords. And basically, we spawned two tasks. Uh, the second task, um, uh, each task uh, has just wait for some time and then exit, printing some messages. And uh, because uh, the second task uh, exits first, and uh, the first one continues to uh, exist for some time. Uh, the whole thing uh, takes uh, two seconds to complete, as you can see in the output. So I called it a little bit. But um, the problem was, uh, how does it work, actually? So what do these cool words mean? Uh, uh, what does uh, uh, a coroutine, how, how it does uh, to give up control, how uh, event loop uh, could decide what to do next, and um, how uh, does it give control back to a coroutine? Now, of course, uh, this simplistic example that will follow, it's by no means, uh, it's only to uh, experiment uh, and in 40, three lines of code to show off uh, and one little aspect of how uh, we could implement the same thing based uh, on uh, knowledge that we have. Probably uh, first students, they uh, learn about 
uh, yield, and then we can build upon that. Sorry. So here, the same coroutine function with kind of emulating a weight. You know, uh, you see the yield statement, uh, which produces much the same output. But uh, here we see uh, an import from a um, special module called async on the yield. It's not a real async just to make this uh, example run and to show off students uh, what could uh, uh, be under the hood. So the event loop is a very interesting thing. And uh, here is the most basic variant uh, with a schedule. And first, uh, there is a, uh, some kind of finding exit uh, processes. Uh, OK. And uh, basically, you see it under 40 lines of code. So uh, we use hands-on praxis, and uh, we uh, wrote the samples uh, line, by, line by line, function by function, so that we could see the result. So output is basically the same, but with adding some debugging. Uh, and you see, no magic. No magic. Uh, uh, so sometimes it may be useful to keep reinventing the wheel, uh, especially for education process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, take it away, Renio. OK, so thank you, very, everyone. So if you missed Stefan's uh, talk earlier today, so he was saying that uh, in some companies, when you're going to talk with your manager, he's like, oh, can you have give me a, a Microsoft Word document? Because that's what I can open. If you give me a notebook, Jupyter Notebook is not going to work. And uh, as you might know, uh, Google Docs or Microsoft Word is pretty nice. You can type and so on. So you can type, hello, and then you can go and you can change the font here. You can make it bigger, like a title and so on. And if you use the spreadsheets, you can have some cool data. You can have some plots. And you can even link the plot to your Google Doc or spreadsheet. So you can go there and say, I want a plot from my sheet. And if the Wi-Fi helps a little bit here, we're going to be on time. So go to Python. And you can search. Let's see how. So what is this? No. What is? So that is is, so you can select the spreadsheet, and you can get your plot, and you can include on your document, and it's going to be there. But uh, if you're like me, you, I don't trust my uh, Excel skills. I always think that they're going to forgot to put uh, some uh, coding somewhere. I really prefer to do things in uh, Pandas, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, and so on. And notebooks are pretty cool because you can have a similar uh, plot, so you can use some cell magic and say uh, matplotlib inline, and you can say import matplotlib on pyplot splt and plot, and you can run two, three, uh, sorry. Thank you. It's always nice to have an audience. They just fix your code faster than you. So you can run that. And you can have a plot. And as I told you before, it's much nicer to generate your plots with pandas, because you're going to be more sure that all your data is correct, and so on. But again, if you work on academia, if you are uh, research, something that it's really, really annoying is to get all your reference correctly. It's so pain in the ass to the point that people in the past tried to solve that. So if you know LaTeX, it's a pretty nice tool to like, have your uh, biography reference correctly. But it's terrible to do that with uh, Jupyter Notebooks. 
uh, you need to have a lot of uh, intermediate steps. So I just want to mention uh, Estensila. It's a project that's uh, being developed at the moment for some people in New Zealand, and I just want to go a, a quick demo. So this is Estensila. You can put a title. It works as a document, so we can say Euro Python here, and you can have some tags. So hello, and you can change some format. So you can say this is a heading and so on. So it works most like a what see what we've gone, but it's much more nice here because you can say, oh, I want to include a reproducible figure. And you can say, oh, I want to use Python because Python is really, really awesome. So here you say Python. Yeah, it's here. It's quite small, but you see. But uh, then you can type your code. And you can run any Python code. So you can say import matplotlib dot Pyplot, SPLT, PLT, plot, one, two, three. Oh, and that is, uh, that is the plot. So it, I think it's pretty nice to do because if you collaborate with lots of people, uh, some people, they're going to be really afraid to use something that's not super close to what you see, what you've gone. And uh, as more and more people are going to contribute to the same document, you probably want to use something in the cloud, and Istensila, it's being uh, able to run things in the cloud, just like as J Jupyter Notebook hubs and so on. Oh, so that's my talk. Thank you very much for listening to me, and thank you, Manjane. So it is ready for it. All right. Uh, so my name is Lush my name is Lushek, and I'm going to talk to you about the ops mindset or an analogy I'm using from time to time. But uh, there's a warning. Uh, an analogy is a shortcut in communication, and if you take a wrong shortcut, you will end up in a wrong place. So use it carefully. So I, a short story of my life in uh, opsing or in operations. After getting my first serious job, uh, I got a small project to do. So obviously, I started writing some code, added some libraries, added some databases, dependencies, and so on. And I was very proud to finish it. Then my colleagues told me, you don't have the whole picture. And they were right. I missed the context, so I added some more code to cover the ground, added some libraries to it, added more dependencies, added something to prettify it. And as you can see, after six months in, uh, in my career, I was the best man in OpSync in the whole world, right? A complicated project. I was really proud of it. I decided to extend it a bit. I planned for it but it didn't work. And I couldn't figure out why it didn't work. It crashed all the time. It didn't work because I was playing this game. <laughs> so as you can see, it's Tetris. And Tetris is a game where all, your, all of your successes disappear and the uh, failures pile up. So uh, the, important part, <laughs> the <laughs> important part is the score. So. As you can see, the score is zero as long as nothing disappears, right? The point is to keep it as simple as possible, not to build up the system to be more complicated. But it's not very useful. Many people said this before. So how is it useful for, useful for you? So as I said, it's a communication shortcut. So uh, in another project, I was working with the developer on a monolith. It tessellated pretty OK. We added some glucose to make it work, but then uh, the developer decided to just add one small feature. And I said, I would prefer it in a separate application. And he said, no, a separate application would be three times as big. So which of those blocks would you prefer in Tetris? Right? So microservices, very small, very easy to use, but try to put, uh, play Tetris when 10 blocks are falling at the same time. You need automation, right? <laughs> automation, orchestration. So who makes the blocks? The hardest part of Tetris is that you don't know what block will fall, right? And obviously, in our game, uh, as ops admins, developers, right? The philosopher Steve Ballmer said so. <laughs> so you can talk to developers, it appears. It was new to me as an administrator. Uh, and uh, of course, developers can talk to their ops to you know, put things together so that it, they are easy to deploy, easy to keep the score high. So operations and probably other things, 
uh, are like Tetris. Development is like making blocks. Score is the important bit, and it's not request per second, it's not revenue, it's the thing you want to get in the end. Okay, so let's work together on maximizing the score. If you find any bugs in my analogy, contact me on those things. And thank you. Thank you, Lecek. Uh, Tox, uh, I want to explain a bit what it is for the people who don't know what it is and where we're going. Um, first, I want to ask you, who heard of Tox? And I don't mean the chat protocol. Okay, it's like 80%. A lot. Uh, who is using it actively? That's like 20%, not enough. Who understands what it does? Well, at least a bit more. <laughs> so, I mean, sometimes uh, I hear, uh, oh, yeah, it talks, well, oh, that's this thing when you have to do really complicated stuff and you have to test against 10,000 versions and interpreters and whatever. I don't need all that. Um, I thought so for a long time, and now I do use it for basically everything, and to get started with it is not so hard. This is why I made this little hello world. You need four files, and that's including a CI tool chain already on GitLab. So you have your production code up here, um, which does something really complicated. Then you have your test code, which is using PyTest in this case. So it's calling my production code and uh, asserting against um, the result. And then I have a tox any, and as I don't have a package and I don't want to install anything, I, I just have these all in one folder and just run it. Uh, I don't want to build a source distribution, and I don't want to install anything, but I want to have PyTest, and I want to run PyTest to run my test. That's all I need. And so you can get started from a very simple project already, and you don't need any complicated rocket science. And if you want to run this in uh, GitLab, then you need four more lines of code. You need a, a Python 3.6 Docker image, and you install Tox with pip, and you run it, and that's it. And that looks, in GitLab, uh, you have to put one switch on, and then you have it uh, in, your, uh, in your CI chain, and that looks like this then there. So it uh, sets up all the, the Docker stuff, runs your test in PyTest, and has a little smiley face in the end that it all worked. So this is how you get started. This is really not rocket science. And where are we going? Um, yeah, well, the vision of Tox before I joined the pro project already was standardized testing in Python. And yeah, standards is always, you create a new standard and you have more standards than before. So that's the old vision, I would say. And the new vision is um, standardize everything. <laughs> um, no, um, yeah, basically what, what, what I'm, I always tell uh, people who ask me about Tox, what you do with it, is I really do everything with it. I, I create development environments, I apply automatic fixes with black and things like that. I build my stuff, I release it, I build documentation, and the nice thing is you have a single entry point, and if you join a new project, you can say Tox minus AV, which gives you all the environments and tells you what you can do in that project um, for testing, releasing, and everything. So for me, that is like a single entry point for developers. This is why I like it, and this is why I would like more people to use it, because if I want to contribute to a project and I see a tox -ini file, I know immediately what to do. Yeah, and I want to thank my employer that he sends me here and gives me time, actually, of paid time so that I can work on tox. I'm really grateful for that. So I wanted to thank him, and yeah, if you want to know more, Bernard Gabor gave, gave a whole uh, test, uh, talk about um, Tox that will be on video soon. His slides are there as well. I think he didn't post them. That's why I put them here. And the slides for this little thing are on GitLab, my uh, handle, Tox Lightning Talk, if you want to look it up. That's Thank you, Oliver. This is so, so good. yeah, this is me. Uh, so yeah, uh, somebody asked me uh, what is uh, my OS minority as Windows 7. I just realized recently because uh, I run minority meetups, so actually I am one minority that I never realized until recently because I'm using Windows 7. <laughs> Um, so being an OS minority is not fun. Why? Because everything I do, I can't find any documentation for me how to install things and all these. Or maybe I can't install it 
anyway, so, um, so I just Google everything. Please save me, Google. Um, so I want to show some example of like the challenges at, that I face. So it's like how you do it normally and how I have to do it. Uh, for example, um, install a Python library, which is um, very simple. Pip install, everybody know how to do it. Uh, if you are using uh, Linux, uh, Mac OS, sudo, give you everything. Me is like, okay, Alaconda prompts. Uh, oh, I have to install Alaconda um, before that, so yeah, and then pip install. So uh, using Git, which is, uh, of course, is a very good uh, version control tool. Uh, you can do like, oh, Git in need and all these things, right? Uh, I have to download Git for Windows. The link is over there. I don't think you're gonna have enough time to copy it, you, but you can Google it. Yeah, and then um, you can you you can use GUI or Git Bash, and then with Git Bash you can just do the normal things. So uh, SSH, yay! I'm using. Uh, I'm trying to use AWS, so I have to do some SSH things. So I found this uh, on that documentation, which is you know I just I can just copy and paste if I don't use uh, Windows 7. So using Windows 7. Um, yeah, <laughs> lots of steps, right? So uh, also Docker, Docker is like, I found it's really good to use. Like I can, you know, have a container and all these things. Like for data scientists, it's a bit new, but it's very nice. But I'm not using Windows 10, so uh, basically when I see Docker, it's like, okay, install, like, um, yeah, Windows user install it, and I just click, but it's only support Windows 10. So there is another instruction for, um, for people who use uh, Windows 7, but uh, yeah. Uh, I will tell you what happened. Uh, basically, if you're using Linux or whatever, you can do app, app get, like Ubuntu, you can use app get, right? But um, for me, I just decided that I would install VirtualBox, set up a VM, install Ubuntu, and then I can do everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So I'm thinking, oh, oh, if we are sharing something open source or something very cool, like shall we give more support for Windows 7 users, like to help the minorities? I think probably not. Just tell them not to use it, like Python 2.7. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. That was awesome talk. So I would like to introduce you to an idea that we started in Poznań, Poland. It's called Pilov, and it's Pilov Org. Um, Pilov is a non-profit organization which is completely open source, so all our materials, lessons are available. And we are promoting Python and teaching Python to anyone, basically. We don't care who you are, where are you from, we will teach you Python. And why we are doing that? Well, uh, the issue was that there was no um, group that is doing it uh, proficient enough in Poznań to get more developers, because as everyone and everywhere, we are missing those and we need more of those. Uh, developers. So our goal was to create some interns or junior level developers uh, in different fields uh, in Python. So we started with a two-day kickoff. There were over 700 submissions for this uh, uh, for this event. We uh, accepted 200 students. Uh, we had 33 uh, mentors, 10 volunteers, three organizers, and it was uh, very nice, uh, very well. Um, we started and finished almost before the object-oriented programming, and after for next 30 weeks, we were training people uh, in various Python uh, parts, obviously starting with object-oriented programming, but we need uh, also virtual and Flask, uh, some Docker, at least basic security, SQL. We even finished with Mongo and, uh, MongoDB and uh, uh, RabbitMQ, but those two, well, basically mistakes for teaching uh, at basic level. Uh, well, we also developed our own learning process. Uh, basically, we started with the quiz on each lesson, then we have the basic theory part, then we have a live quiz, which was a summary of the theory by asking questions, and if someone get the answer wrong, we are telling people what exactly did they do wrong, and those were, those were mostly ABC or true or false questions. Uh, we also check the attendance, uh, make some exercises, and then uh, send homeworks and uh, gather feedback from each lesson. So the feedback loop was working very well, also regarding like the speed of the uh, workshops. Uh, then we also introduced, introduced the project, so after two months of learning, they started to do basic Flask application. Uh, into we split them into teams. Uh, provided some criteria, so specification for the uh, for the project, 
And then they presented twice the project during the course, and there was a final presentation at the end for all of the stakeholders, including sponsors and the venue of the university that provided us the space to do everything that. Uh, we also had an exam to uh, measure their knowledge, but also measure our like, ability to deliver the knowledge. Uh, there are a few questions which are not trivial, uh, but if someone thinks about it, and they had access to internet and the Python interpreter, they could just run it. So uh, it wasn't that hard. It was mostly about uh, focusing on thinking. Uh, there are a few screens on the project. Uh, this one was the best looking one, basically. Uh, it's fully working stock manager for a car uh, company. Uh, and the second one, the recipe manager, was created by one person. Uh, so the team broke down to one person, and it still was working application. And the one of the funniest one was the graveyard manager. So you could manage your own graveyard. Uh, well, obviously, uh, to motivate people more, we had a reward. We have five paid internship uh, spots in three different companies. So people, after finishing our course, could start as a data engineer, uh, automated tester, or software engineer, depending on the company they were applying to for the interns. And during the course itself, uh, four people, at least of what I know, get an internship somewhere else, uh, regardless of those uh, propositions we had for them repaired. So we used application to uh, scale that up because we have 10, uh, 10, in 10 people for each uh, mentor. Uh, and application handled all of the stuff I mentioned before, starting from the recruitment till, uh, till uh, execution of the uh, workshop. If you want to help to develop it or see what it looks like and uh, play with it, there's the link. It's a quite simple stack, but it's useful. Uh, we are planning the next edition, uh, the same uh, schema. So two-day workshop, uh, weekly workshops from October to June, then exam and project presentation, and then the internships. What can you do? Well, we are looking for companies who will take uh, another bunch of interns after this year edition for the summer uh, internship. If you are interested, just find me and ping me, or you can Google me, whatever. Uh, you can become a sponsor. You can help with the application, or you can propose something else. Uh, translating uh, that back to the English or fixing the English parts will also be nice. Uh, and now I will switch to PyCon PL presentation. But I think you should get a round of applause for that talk. Yeah. Big Thank round you. of applause, please. So, I'm all, uh, what do you think will happen if you gather 500 Pythonistas in one place in the middle of nowhere for four days? <laughs> Yeah, basically you can try that on PyCon PL. Uh, PyCon PL is in Ossa, which is in Poland, uh, from 23rd to 26th uh, Octo uh, August. Uh, we are the second oldest PyCon from 2008. Uh, around 500 people every year. We have programming challenge, over 45 talks and uh, 10 workshops. Most of them, so like over 75% is in English, and that's the important part. Uh, some pictures, a party grill, more party grill. Uh, the pricing, well, we are quite cheap co conference, I would say. Uh, the current maximal price for the individual ticket is 330 euros, and that includes accommodation. And everyone is sleeping in the same hotel, so it's quite nice. And if you are sponsored by a company, the maximal price you can pay is 520 euros. That, all, that both includes the transfer from the airport. So basically, you need to only get to Warsaw, and from there, you will get to the conference. More details are pylpycon.org, or you can just talk with us here at the conference. I was hoping to deliver that yesterday, but if you find us, just grab us. Thank you. Thank you. Take it away. Yeah. So good afternoon. Uh, I'm Katja, and I, I would like to invite to for the first PyCon Balkan in the Balkan area. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna happen in Belgrade in Serbia and we are gonna have like five hundred uh, attendees and it's gonna be in November. And this is the first PyCon in the Balkan area so I hope you can join us. And also it's gonna be all in English. It's a good thing to mention. Uh, we already have some keynotes so if you want, join us, please. 
Thank you. A round of applause. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Glad to see you all here. My name is Irina. I'm one of the organizers of Python conference in Russia, PCPI. We are going to have the conference on 2nd and 3rd of November and expect to meet around 200 participants, and it's going to happen in St. Petersburg. The venue of the conference is Four Star Hotel, close to the airport and close to the city. And uh, we also have everything in English, like website, booklets, pages. Talks are also in English, or they are translated into English. Uh, as an international conference, we invite foreign speakers, and some of them you can meet here and actually ask about their experience. St. Petersburg is a really beautiful European city with great culture. And this picture was made uh, on the third day of last conference because uh, we have really nice cultural program for speakers. So if any one of you is interested in attending the conference, uh, feel free to find me and also for other events in uh, Russia. Thank you. I would like to talk about Game of Thrones because you like winter. Do you like winter? No, we want to have, oh, so, we want to have summer, we have to have your side pie in the summer, and that will be right there in Italy. So we moved to, to Italy this time for the 11th season of our Euro side pie conference. It's a very nice event. Uh, it will be the end of August till September. We have two days of three track tutorials, very interesting tutorials. We have two days of two track talks and we have two days of sprints. And we have a wide, very wide variety of topics. We start from astronomy to zoology. So we have pretty much anything that you can think of in terms of scientific usage of Python. It's a very, very interesting, very nice conference. So we are invited to come to Italy to the summer. GeoPython 2019, it's still far away, June 24 to 26 in Basel, Switzerland. It's a special conference, it's not only just Python, it's Python and Geo, so, so we have a, a specialty conference in this case. It's about um, geography, geophysics, geodesy, geomatics, and all geo-related things. We also have machine learning uh, tracks, etc., etc. So if you're interested in Geo, come to GeoPython 2019. Thank you. Um, do you like programming games in Python? Yeah, okay. Um, this is gonna be an unusual conference because it is not a conference. You do not uh, attend in person. You use the internet to uh, meet other people and program games alongside them. All you need to do to uh, participate in the next Pi Week in October is to put that date into your calendar and go to that link on uh, or near that date, before that date. Um, that, that week is the, the actual week where we will be programming games. The week before that is voting. Um, so there are some themes made available and you pick, uh, you rate them in the order that you, you want to do them and a theme will be picked and then you program for a week on that theme um, and then you upload and then we have two weeks of playing each other's games. And these are some of the winners uh, from previous weeks. The big one, I did that with Larry Hastings, who's a core developer, and, and we won, so, yeah. Thank you. Pass it. Hi, everyone. Maybe I get a few extra seconds, and I'm going to talk to you about five different uh, conferences. I want to welcome you to, invite you to a PyCon in Africa, which you might not have considered. So, um, in a few days' time, I'll be going to the first PyCon Ghana um, uh, in uh, Accra. And then uh, in September, you'll have the opportunity to go to PyCon Nigeria, uh, PyCon South Africa in October, and also PyCon Zimbabwe. And then um, when February comes around again, uh, PyCon Namibia, where I've been uh, several times and wouldn't miss it for anything. So you can find out more about all of these. Uh, most of them have websites. Um, they're different from PyCons that you might be used to in some ways, but very similar. Um, in others, so take a note of that. It's important for you as Python people because it gives you the chance to go to a place maybe where you've never been, not just be a tourist, but do and be what you do and be best, which is be a, a Pythonista. So it could be you in one of these photographs doing something that you will remember 
uh, for a very long time, which will have a big impact on you and make a big impression on you. And you also, in turn, will be making a big impression on the people that you meet. So please consider it. Um, plenty of us go to these events. You won't be alone, and you will find and make brand new friends. Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, and then uh, a little bit closer than Africa uh, is Newcastle upon Tyne. So it's a, it's a, just a monthly meetup. Uh, you know, really friendly people. We're always looking for goods for speakers, or if you know, so if you wanna, if if you wanna sort of like speak on something that's interesting, um, it's, it's a great place to just sort of like speak to a much smaller crowd. Um, and yeah, and we have like a really sort of wide range of topics. You know, uh, data science, web development, IoT, education. Um, are sort of the things we typically cover. Uh, that's on the second Wednesday of every month. There's the website. You can sign up um, or just email um, scott at pythonnortheast.com if you're interested in speaking, and I'll get back to you pretty quickly. Cheers. Who here has heard of San Sebastian? Um, yeah, so in the midday, if you look at the sun, you go straight to it, right? And ah, it's okay. Um, well, so it's in the north of north of Spain, in the coast. This is a conference. Uh, it's on a weekend, so you don't have to take holidays for it. It, it feels like holidays. So on Friday night, we usually go for pinchos. Um, Saturday, we go for cider house. Not. I don't recommend vegans to come, I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> this year uh, we, are, we are changing venue. We are come doing it in the Cursal. It's like five meters to the beach. So if there is a boring talk, you can just go to the beach. Um, it's the, five, the fifth piece we make. Uh, we are not very organized, so uh, just, just follow us on Twitter. It's going to happen. It's, it's going to be from October 12th to 14th. Yeah, just, uh, well, you, you know how to reach me on Telegram or follow us on Twitter. We, are, we usually have nice keynote speakers and we usually have a lot of fun. It's a nice conference. Last year we were 70. The first time we were 25. Uh, so it's growing. I hope not too much more. Um, we, o we only have one track. Uh, it's very family. Uh, yeah, um, just come. All right. Um, so my story begins in Mastodon. Uh, so Mara asked for a chocobot that goes quay every hour or something. Uh, by the way, by the way, um, how many of you here have used Mastodon? OK, well, Mastodon is like Twitter, but less popular. Um, so I thought, you know what? OK, fine. I'll do it. Why not? It's pretty stupid, a bot that just goes quiet every hour. So I did it. Um, and I did it in the D programming language. Uh, it was easier than I thought, and it made me really appreciate D. Um, there's some spoilers down here where I link to the code, but before that, let's look at, there it is. Just goes quick every hour. Uh, it's apparently in Chinese, but you can see that <laughs> on the right, those are timestamps. <laughs> and uh, most of the time he quiz very, very quietly, but once in a while he gets excited and he quiz very loudly. Well, it's not here anymore. Um, so the way, uh, Oh, and here you can see a better picture of him, the chocobot. Um, so as I said, it's in D, uh, which, by the way, I hosted on Mercurial. Uh, how many of you use Mercurial? Oh, that's more than I thought. But still, Mercurial is like Git, but less popular. Uh, <laughs> and this is, of course, the D programming language, which how many of you know about D? Wow, that's a lot more than I thought. But regardless, D is like Rust, but less popular. Uh, um, of course, it begins with, with a copyright header because that, that, uh, uh, I like how copyrights. Now, the statements here are D is kind of like 
C, kind of like Python, but it's in the general family of the C family. So like JavaScript, uh, Java, in terms of syntax, I mean. The imports are all standard library here. I didn't use anything but a standard library. The first function here is the que function. By the way, a que sounds like something like que. Um, and the first thing that I do here is I just pick some random squawks. Um, this is a, a weighted dice, die. Um, most of, so it's, it's weighted towards the first one, which is 40, the weight. Uh, the next is sleep. Right here, I, um, I make the chocobot sleep for a random number between 40 and, and, and 80 minutes. You don't want it to be too predictable, right? Because otherwise it's not fun. Otherwise you're just gonna see like it's always the same time. Uh, finally, this bottom here thing is curl. Curl is part of the D standard library. Um, and it just posts right here to the um, Mastodon API. There's a, there's a bots in space Mastodon instance that accepts bots where I put ch Chocobot. And finally, all I do is forever loop and just que forever and sleep. So que, sleep, que, sleep. Um, I really like D. I recommend you, you, you check it out, uh, dlang.org. Um, it has some really nice examples here. Here's, for example, how to make a web server. Um, it's all based on the vibe.d. So it's really nice. D is compiled. It compiles to machine code. It's very fast. You have never seen a faster website than D. It's, it's a web framework that compiles to machine code. Very nice. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Jody.